Just 50 years ago, the tiny nation of Qatar was one of the poorest territories of Great Britain, relying on pearling and fishing. Today, Qatar has a GDP per capita of roughly $95,000. That's more than double that of the United Kingdom. And this year, Qatar has put itself on the map by being the first Arab nation to host the World Cup. So how did this tiny peninsula with a population of just under 3 million transform into a gas giant and one of the wealthiest nations in the world? Qatar has been ruled as a hereditary monarchy by the House of Thani since Mohammed bin Thani signed a treaty with the British in 1868 that granted it separate status from Bahrain, but it remained a British protectorate. When its pearl trade collapsed in the 1920s, the country was marked by widespread poverty, malnutrition, and disease. But then in 1939, the discovery of oil in Dukhan gave the country a new source of revenue and expanded the ruling family's wealth. The country slowly began to modernize, and in the 1950s, its first school, hospital, and power plant were opened. But the oil revenue was nothing compared with the discovery of its natural gas reserves that were found 30 years later. In 1971, the same year Qatar gained its independence from Britain, the country discovered the largest natural gas reserve in the world off its coast. The Northfield, which borders Iran's South Pars field, is so vast that it's roughly the same size as Qatar itself, with reserves that could last 600 years. But due to its existing reliance on petroleum, the North Field wasn't developed until 20 years later. It was only in 1995, when a bloodless coup dethroned the Emir, that Qatar's fortunes shifted, placing it on a path to transformation. Sheikh Hamad bin Khalifa Al Thani seized control of the country from his father, Khalifa, who was on a trip to Switzerland. Sheikh Hamad immediately sped up the development of the North Field and Qatar began exporting liquid natural gas. With its wealth rapidly growing, the country took measures to diversify its economy at the turn of the new millennium. During this decade, Qatar's GDP was the fastest growing in the world. In 2005, the Qatar Investment Fund was established and began investing in Porsche, Volkswagen, Barclays Bank, and Harrods. At home, the country opened museums, commercial hubs, and academic institutions, including branches of prestigious colleges like Georgetown University. It also established itself as a transport hub, growing its airline globally to compete with its Gulf neighbor, the United Arab Emirates. Alongside economic growth, Sheikh Hamad looked to secure Qatar a seat at the international decision-making table and gain global influence. Meanwhile, the country's influential Prime Minister, Hamad bin Jassim bin Jabr al Thani, used Qatar's vast wealth to push for a different foreign policy, one that would allow the country to influence regional issues and work with Western powers as a regional mediator. This included hosting high-level talks between Palestinian factions, negotiations between the US and the Taliban, and as a political safe haven for political Islamic groups like the Muslim Brotherhood. The founding of Al Jazeera in 1996 helped place Qatar on the map as a soft power, and following its coverage of the Iraq War and later the Arab Spring, the network cemented itself as a key player in global media and as a regional counterpoint to the state-controlled media landscapes of its neighbors. But this sudden emergence of Qatar and its politics irked its neighbors. We want to see uh, Qatar uh, implement the promises it made a few years back uh, with regard to its support for extremist groups, with regards to its hostile media, with regards to its interference uh, in the affairs of other countries. In 2017, a blockade was placed on a tiny peninsula by Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain and Egypt, who cut diplomatic, economic and travel connections. The blockade further strengthened Qatar's relationship with other regional powers, Turkey and Iran, but pushed it away from its support for the Muslim Brotherhood. By the time the blockade was lifted in 2021, Al Jazeera had softened its critiques of its neighbors, and the government began using its diplomatic weight to push for reconciliation between Turkey and Arab countries. 
Today, Qatar has become one of the largest holders of real estate in London, and its property empire is thought to be worth in excess of $12 billion. It also owns the majority share of the city's iconic skyscraper, the Shard, which houses Al Jazeera's London Bureau. Qatar's sovereign wealth fund has an estimated $450 billion of assets, which includes a majority stake in the Paris Saint-Germain football team. This year, the Gulf state has become the first Arab nation to host the World Cup, following a FIFA campaign marred by allegations of corruption and migrant exploitation. Human rights groups estimate thousands of migrant workers were killed in the 12 years of construction leading up to the 2022 World Cup. Qatar disputes the figures, but recently admitted the figure could be as high as 500. Despite passing sweeping labor reforms in recent years, Qatar continues to face pressure over its human rights record and LGBTQ laws, but it has accused Western powers of hypocrisy over their critiques. During the tournament, Qatar signed a number of historic LNG deals with China and Germany worth $60 billion and $6.7 billion. Having put an estimated $200 billion of investment into the world's largest sporting tournament, Qatar hopes the World Cup will cement its place not only as an energy giant, but as an entertainment hub, a peace broker, and a regional superpower.